I remember this one story of this um, family. They they'd got a generator, got a really good deal on it. You know, good, just amazing price for this generator, and they were good to go. And then the night arrived where they had a blackout, and they powered the generator up, and they had their house lit up like a Christmas tree. Everything was great till the lady came home and and hit her garage door opener. And something, I don't know what happened, but something malfunctioned and a voltage spike went through the house and wiped out thousands of dollars of electronic Mm. equipment and sensitive things like that. So all that to say, please don't go the cheap route if you can at all help it with a generator. Get quality. The Ready Life into the country. Hi there, I'm Nick Meisner. And I'm Lisa, his wife. (laughs) And welcome back to the Ready Life Podcast, where we show you how to make your home and your family as independent as possible for your basic necessities, things like water, food, heat, and power. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about a very popular question that comes up with a lot of folks, and that is what kind of a fuel powered generator should I get for a backup power source for my home? And uh, this is a great question because a fuel powered generator, while we don't really like them, you know, they're not a independent power source and we like to get as independent or um, renewable or whatever you want to call it as possible, Mm -hmm. but they do have their place and they can be a great backup. We don't like them as a primary power source for sure because then you're dependent upon fuel and the, you know, you're know you gonna be running the engine like crazy. I have seen people use a fuel powered generator as their primary power source. Oh yes, oh yes. Like 24 <laughs> seven. And that's, it's not common. So not a lot of people, but there are some folks that have done that and it takes a lot of fuel, puts a lot of wear and tear on the engine. You burn it up you know, before too long. It doesn't last all that long. And yeah, not a great option, but it does have its place. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That's right. Yeah. So first, the first when we're thinking about a generator is we have to answer the question, what do you want a generator for? Hmm. That really is the, the most basic first question you have to ask. Yeah. What's your use case? Yes. Right. So, you know, one option, the, the first one that comes to my mind that's a common one that a lot of folks are looking for is they have a conventional on-the-grid home and they want to have a generator there for a time when there's a blackout or something mm-hmm. like that. And they want the generator to power everything in their home as if the power wasn't even out. Just make it where it just, per, their home just keeps running the same as it did when it when the power was on. Well, with a few lights turned off, perhaps. <laughs> no, I mean with everything. With everything on, running. The, okay. Yeah, some folks want that, and if that's what you're looking for, just be aware that it's going to require potentially a huge generator, especially if your home is fully electric for all mm-hmm. of the appliances, all of the big appliances, things like water heater, you know. Yeah, we often range. talk about the big four. So right. if your big four are all electric, then you're going to have to have a pretty large generator in order to keep up with all of that. Right. So, the big four being water heater, electric water heater, electric oven range, an electric clothes dryer, or an electric HVAC, like, you know, central heating and air system, that kind of thing. So that's one use case scenario where you want a generator to power your on-grid home, everything from stem to stern. Uh, What's another use case scenario? Well, another option would be to have a generator as a backup, but only power um, like part, like certain appliances. So you wouldn't power the entire house. You would just wire the generator into certain circuits in your house just to keep Things like your freezers running or um, water pump, water pump running, so you still have water. Um, things like that that lights. you, yeah, maybe some lights. Um, things like that that would be a little bit more challenging to live without. Right, 
And in that kind of a use case situation, you wouldn't have to have such a large generator because you're not trying to power all of these great big massive loads. You're just powering some relatively small ones like you know water pump, fridge, the things that Lisa was mentioning. So that could save you some uh, on the generator where you wouldn't have to buy such a large one. Also, it doesn't burn as much fuel, things like that. So that's another use case that might be you. And, uh, you know, where you fall, that that is, if you're talking a, a kind of halfway system there, it could go either direction where you include a whole bunch of things and you're more on that side, or it could be very, very minimal where you've, you don't have to power hardly anything. So the size of your generator, all of this is going to depend on where you fall in that spectrum. Uh, but that's where a lot of folks are because they, they look into this and they see that powering their entire home would take perhaps a bigger generator than they realized. And so they go this route. But then the other main use case that comes to mind would be if you are currently off the grid with a, like a solar power system or something like that, and you want a fuel powered generator to serve as your backup for those times when it, you might get a string of cloudy weather where you're just not making enough solar power to keep up with your needs and your batteries have gotten discharged and you need to charge them up. You just need a, a backup generator to charge up your batteries every now and then in the, gen, in the winter. So in that kind of a situation, um, you can dramatically reduce the size of your off-grid solar power system and the cost of your off-grid solar power system mm -hmm. by incorporating a fuel-powered generator into the mix. If you're going strictly solar, unless you're in a really, really favorable climate, like uh, Arizona is the state I keep <laughs> picking on for that because it's a great solar state. Unless you're in a state like Arizona, then it's going to be it's going to take a uh, sizable solar system to power 100% where you never have any other input from any other source. And so uh, in our neck of the woods, for instance, that would be especially challenging in the winter months, those three, mm -hmm. three or four months in the winter where we have short days that are super cloudy and all of that. And having a fuel-powered generator to supplement, to charge up, the batteries every now and then when we've gotten some really cloudy weather, that enables us to uh, use a much more economical solar power system. Yes. And, um, so those are the, the main use cases. Let's jump into some specifics about, uh, you know, specific questions that might come to your mind when you're looking at possibly getting a generator. And one of those would be the size, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. So with the size, it depends on a lot of factors. I'm going to sound like a lawyer today because <laughs> it really does depend on your individual situation. I'm going to try and give you some some a rough idea of what to expect, but you know, we've got the size of your home. The bigger your home is, then the bigger certain things are going to be like a central heating and air system and your water heater. Yeah, water heater and a lot of the equipment, the infrastructure of your home is going to be bigger and use more power and things like that number of people is a significant factor on this, but probably the single biggest factor in all of this is what we alluded to earlier with those big appliances like the big four. Yes. Are those electric or are they gas or some other alternative source um, operating them or powering them? And so if you are fully electric for everything, it's going to take a significantly larger generator than if you were primarily a gas-based home. So just be aware of that. And you know, just to give you a really, really ballpark, rough idea, it would not be uncommon to need a 20 to 30 kilowatt generator to power everything in mm -hmm. your home, You know, to have a generator that would make your home function as if it was on the grid. It could take that that size of a generator or even more or less. If you're on the upper spectrum, everything electric and you've got a big home, it could even take more than that. If you're mostly gas and your home is on the smaller side of the spectrum, it could be less than that 20 to 30 range. But I think that's a good uh, average size range for homes that have at least a portion of their big appliances as electric. And um, I will say 
We uh, one thing that's really helpful is to kind of get some real numbers into the mix so that we're not just talking in generalities. And so we have a link on the show notes page to a calculator that will help you in figuring out a, a rough estimate of what the size of your generator might need to be. So if you go to the show notes page, thereadylife.com forward slash 21, that's 21, thereadylife.com forward slash 21, the numbers, um, that will get you to our show notes page where there will be a link there. And um, also we may have a, a link in the description of this episode too. So check that out. You can customize it there and get a better, more accurate idea of what to expect. But that's what you're looking at for the full home setup. Now, what what's our um, next option or category that we need to look at with generator sizing? So then the next category, which we already mentioned earlier, is if you decided to just power part of your home, just mm. more of the essential appliances and maybe some lights, um, like your freezers or fridge, your water pump, um, maybe one or two other things. So you wouldn't need as large of a generator, obviously, just to power a few items. Right. And, you know, as far as what size, once again, it depends. I'd use the calculator that I mentioned before to figure out the specifics for you, which items you want to power at the same time. And, and But, you know, 8 to 12 kilowatts might be a, a decent range to think of, um, you know, it, it just all depends because it just depends on how many of those circuits you're going to throw in the mix here. And whether you've got an electric water heater or a propane one. Too. Yeah, but we're saying no, we're, or, we're leaving off the yeah, big stuff here that's true. for this particular <laughs> option. We're leaving off that stuff. It's just the essentials, but, you know, the size of your water pump. If you've got a gargantuan water pump, then you might that's going to impact things and if you if you're that's on the true. larger side of other things so but i hope that gives you some si some sort of an idea of what you might be expecting with a system or with a generator that's just running you know the more commonly needed necessary items in your home and then we come to let's see what was the third so the third one is an off-grid power mm, system yes. you would use a generator perhaps to cut the cost of your power system, and then you'd have to use that to just supplement during the darker, uh, cloudier days. Right. So for the size that you'd need for that, I mean, there are people that charge their batteries with a two or 3,000 watt generator. It, it can be done. But <laughs> that's not what I recommend. I would recommend a bare minimum of five kilowatts and mm -hmm. preferably in the six to eight kilowatt range, plus or minus, if you have a really large power system, a large home, then you might want to go a little higher. You might want to go 10 or even 12. If you have a really teeny tiny system, then, then you may be just fine with a four or five kilowatt generator. But we've lived with a five kilowatt generator for a number of years. And it worked fine for us. We did have to be a little bit more intentional about what things we had on at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we're charging our batteries and we're multitasking. We're also trying to use uh, as, do as much of our big power consuming tasks as possible, which is usually like laundry. And vacuuming the house and mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Sometimes you run the waffle iron when the generator is going or things like that. Not that you have to. Yeah. It just makes sense. The generator is running anyway. So in it, you know, just plugging in a few more things isn't going to use much more gas at all. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just makes sense to do that. Multitasking saves, uh, it makes everything a lot more efficient. And so if you're doing that, then having a larger generator enables you to do more multitasking. When we were operating with a five kilowatt generator, we could do a certain amount of multitasking, mm -hmm. but we would start getting close to, we would be kind of maxing it out at times, yeah. and which is okay. Uh, you know, the, the advantage to having a smaller generator is that they, all other things being equal, it doesn't use as much fuel as a larger generator. Mm. But, um, you know, it, it's it's up to you. Like I said, people have have done all right with a teeny tiny generator, like two or three kilowatts. But 
all they're using that for is charging the batteries. That's it. They're not doing this multitasking that we're talking about. Yeah. And once again, use the the um, generator size calculator to help you out there in figuring out what items you you want to run. The thing that you're gonna add, the thing that's gonna be different about this than a conventional home setup is that you're also gonna be adding charging the batteries into the mix. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna depend upon the size of your charger that's charging your batteries. So that's generator size, a little bit about generator size. I hope that's helpful to you and I think the calculator will be. What else? What are the other items that we wanted to... So other factors you want to look at is like the fuel type. There's more than one type of generator that like uses different types of fuels. So you could get, um, for example, a gasoline generator, which is what we have. Um, or there's also a diesel generator, which uh, mom and dad have one. And then there's a propane generator, which we actually did have a propane generator when we first moved here. But then we eventually switched to a gas-powered generator. So I think those are the three primary mm. type of generators. Obviously, there's all kinds of generators out there that yeah. right. <laughs> you might be able to come up with. But. Right. So you might be wondering, why did we pick a gasoline generator? And is that what we recommend for everybody? Not necessarily. We picked a gasoline generator for for one reason we don't run the generator that much. You know, mm -hmm. for the majority of the year, we are 100% solar. It's only for those few winter months where we're topping the batteries off with the generator. So we don't put that many hours on it. And uh, because of that, it wasn't as important of a decision for us which one we went with. Uh, we, we did want quality. So we wanted yeah. a good quality one, but as far as you know, when, when we dig into diesel, you can see some benefits there that we didn't need. And uh, yeah, propane has some definite advantages as well. But I guess we should dig in to yeah. each one. Why why gas? Why diesel? Yeah. So, why propane? As far as gas goes, one of the things that I like about a, a typical gasoline generator is it is somewhat portable. Even if it's on the larger side, yes, it can be a bit of a pain, but they'll usually have wheels on them of some sort. And you know, a couple of guys can pick it up, put it on the back of a pickup, and haul it into a shop if it needed to be repaired or something. Or, or a couple, <laughs> not yeah. just a couple of guys. We did it. We picked it up. I mm -hmm. thought we ran it down the ramp off of the. Pickup. But to get it up on the trailer, we got it. We picked it up. Hmm. Ish. Or you can use a come along. <laughs> yes. We we use a come along a lot because we don't have a tractor, and so we'll. We have some big trees that are near each other, and we'll string a chain up between the two trees, mm -hmm. hook a come along up to it, and pick things up off of a trailer, pull the trailer out from under it, and then set it down on the ground. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I, you know what? I do think we pushed it up a ramp to get it on the truck. Mm, okay. But we did it. Yes. Yeah. And I think I think we used the come along. We use a come along a lot. We do use yeah. a come along a lot <laughs> for a lot of things Yep. to kind of make up for... A little bit of lack over here. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's one advantage. Uh, fuel is readily available at gas stations and all over the place. It's not tethered. You know, a gas generator is not tethered to a propane tank or something like that. And this was one of the significant factors to us. It's often but not always less expensive than some of the other comparable fuel types, you know, like a, a diesel generator in particular. They can be kind of spendy, but with gasoline, also the fuel can go bad in a fairly short period of time if you don't store it properly. So that's kind of the rundown of my thoughts on a gasoline generator. Um, let's see, what about diesel? Why don't we talk about diesel? What would be some of the points with that? Well, you're the one who knows more about diesel. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had any experience with it. Diesels <laughs> are... Yeah, they're a great option if you're going to be running them a lot. If you're going to be putting a lot of hours on on the generator, then diesel's probably the way to go, especially, and I'm going to get a little technical here, but especially at 1,800 RPM diesel engine. You Nowadays, I didn't used to see this years ago, but nowadays there's a lot of 3,600 RPM diesel in, uh, generators out there. 
And RPM stands for revolutions per minute. It's talking about how quickly the engine is turning, how many times it's running through its cycle per minute. And as you can imagine, a engine that's running at that's running at half the speed that's you know revolving half as many times per minute, it's just naturally going to last longer and be heavier duty. So usually your more industrial grade engines in the diesel world are going to be 1800 RPMs. And nothing against the 3600 RPM diesels, but they just be aware that they're not going to probably last as long as your industrial grade ones. But they're big, they're heavy, you don't just go and pick those things up. Nope. You, you're gonna you need plant it and then it stays there. Yeah, you're going <laughs> to need heavy equipment to move that thing around. And uh, they are expensive. They, you can expect to pay a good bit of money, uh, hmm. significantly more than you would pay for a gas generator or even in most cases for a propane generator. Diesels are going to be more spendy. But the fuel is widely available um, it can go bad quickly if you don't store it properly. It's a little more stable than gasoline, but still can go bad fairly quickly. And the other drawback is that it can be challenging to start a diesel in extreme cold. So just be aware of that. I remember your dad having this little like torch thing that he would light and go out to start up this diesel generator. <laughs> yeah, that was a special generator. Most diesels are more refined than that. That one didn't have glow plugs or anything. So it, <laughs> it was an old beast. <laughs> yeah, it was like a World War II era um, design. So, <laughs> Anyhow, um, propane is the other mm -hmm. option. Mm -hmm. So with propane, really, the it has some similarities with gas as far as pros and cons. The biggest advantage of propane would be that fuel doesn't go bad. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly something to be said for that because fuel issues account for a lot of the issues with a, a gas engine. And, Especially uh, if you're using it as just a backup and only, you know, during emergencies, then that fuel just sits there inside of your generator too. Right. So, so propane is really popular for backup generators that do a lot of sitting around. And so that that's a great um, advantage there. But it is tethered to a propane tank, so that's a drawback. Commercial grade options can be spendy. There's residential or homeowner grade options too that are fairly comparable with a gasoline generator, but the, the high quality commercial grade ones can be spendy. And um, another advantage that comes to mind, potentially, I, I don't have ironclad proof on this, but I've, I've heard this from mechanics and it makes sense that a engine running on propane is gonna run cleaner than an engine running on gasoline. It's a cleaner fuel. Hmm. The propane is, and or or natural gas, similarly, is going to be cleaner than gasoline, and so the engine could last longer, less um, wear and uh, tear. Yeah, less dirtiness, getting in the oil, particulate, whatever you want to call it, and things like that. So it could potentially last longer. So that's some pros and cons of all three. Like I said, propane is getting to be. Well, I don't know. Gasoline generators are still really popular, but you you see them all over the place in box stores and, and places, you know, the mm -hmm. big the big stores, the Walmarts and the Costcos and the Sam's Clubs and all of this. Yes. But they've got propane options sometimes too. So which one is most popular? I don't know. But propane is getting to be more and more popular than it used to be in, in years past. But that kind of takes us into our next factor we wanted to look at. Yeah, we walk into a, a Costco and they've got a nice generator there. How do we know it's actually good quality? Like what are some good brands that might, you know, that we might recommend? And does it even matter? Yeah, or does it matter? <laughs> so if you want the short and the skinny, I'm going to recommend that you don't buy a generator from Costco, Walmart, Sam's Club, <laughs> any of those kinds of places. They usually don't have a good quality generator there. Usually they're going to be on the cheaper end of the spectrum. The reason why it matters, well, there's a number of factors, but one is, of course, the engine life. If it's a cheapo engine, it's going to not last as long. It's going to not be reliable, as reliable, things like this. But even 
with some name brand engines. Like you'll sometimes see a generator that has a Honda engine in some mm. of these stores. Mm -hmm. And they really make that prominent. And you think, oh, I'm getting a Honda generator. But look closely <laughs> because unless they are a authorized Honda dealer, it's not going to be a Honda generator. It may have a Honda engine in it, but the generator as a whole is not a Honda, which means you have no idea what's going on with the electric side of this, the generator and, and all of the, the electric and electronic side of the generator. And I have heard stories of people that have uh, purchased cheap generators that had cheap electric parts and hmm. they experienced power surges and things like this that have wiped out their uh, equipment in their house sometimes. Like I remember this one story of this um, family, they, they'd got a generator, got a really good deal on it, you know, good, just amazing price for this generator and they were good to go. And then the night arrived where they had a blackout and they powered the generator up and they had their house lit up like a Christmas tree. Everything was great till the lady came home and, and hit her garage door opener and something, I don't know what happened, but something malfunctioned and a voltage spike went through the house and wiped out thousands of dollars of electronic mm. equipment and sensitive things like that. So all that to say, Please don't go the cheap route if you can at all help it with a generator. Get quality and, you know, get a, a good brand name that you trust. And Makes me think of the old adage, you get what you pay for. <laughs> this is true. And even, you know, I, I'm, I'm picking again on Honda engines. I, I like Honda, as I'm about to tell you. I, I, I do like Honda. But my understanding is that Honda makes a lower grade of engines for some of these uh you know, like a homeowner grade of engine, you mm -hmm. might say, for some of these that gets ends up getting put into some of these cheap generators. So just be aware of that. So as far as brands, though, for the gas generators, if you're talking like a smaller, on the smaller side of the spectrum, a smaller gas generator, I would, like I said, I'm partial to Honda. We've had really good experience with mm -hmm. Honda generators. We've used them for years and they're they're really good. And so that's that's the I'm sure that there's others. I'm not saying they're the only good ones. I'm just saying that's that would be my recommendation if if you're interested. And I assume mm -hmm. that's why you're here is because you want to hear what our recommendation is. So that's what it would be for us a, you know, on the smaller side of the spectrum, a, a gasoline generator. For diesels, I, you know, there's some good options out there. I like Kubota, Onan, Isuzu. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's others. I think Generac makes some decent diesel, or I, I doubt that they make the gen the engines, but they have some decent diesel uh, generators as well. Once again, you would, if you want it to be the higher quality industrial grade that's going to last a long time, you'd like to find one that's 1800 RPMs. Mm -hmm. um, and for propane, there's Onan and Generac. Has Both of those have some decent options. And even some gasoline generators can be converted over to propane. You can sometimes find kits for some, even Hondas. Uh, yes, it might void the warranty, perhaps. So, you know, whatever whatever your comfort level is with that. But there there are ways to convert some of these gasoline generators over to propane as well so that you can kind of have the best of both worlds with with some of these things. So anyhow, that's kind of the skinny version of some of my recommendations on generator brands. Hmm. Now, I do have something, one quick thing that I wanted to mention. This may sound a little bit technical. Please bear with me. I'm not going to spend very long on it. So so just just hear me out. There is uh, a lot of portable generators have the, so, so bear in mind that with a electrical connection, you've got positive, you've got negative, or sometimes called neutral, 
and you've got ground. I'm going to try and make this as simplistic as simplistic as possible so you electricians and electrical engineers out there don't beat me up too bad here. But just <sighs> simply, we've got positive, negative, or neutral, and ground. And with, with uh, a lot of portable generators that are made for like job site use, we're talking the kind of generators that you can pick up and haul around to a job site, they are often built where the negative or neutral is connected or bonded to the ground. And that is, we call that, you know, neutral bonded to ground or something like that. And and the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, if you are using that generator independently of anything else, you're just plugging something into the generator and running it, that's great, and they set it up the right way for that kind of a scenario. But if you're hooking that generator up to your house, that's not what you want because the electrical code stipulates that you only want ground and neutral to be bonded in one place in the entire system. If you have ground and neutral bonded in more than one place, then the ground wire could end up potentially carrying electricity in the event of a wiring issue, and that ground wire is not made to carry electricity. If you've ever looked at electrical wires in a in a house, the ground wire is bare. It doesn't have insulation around it. It's often smaller than the other wires. It's not made for carrying electricity. And so this is not a safe arrangement. If you take a generator where the neutral and ground are bonded, and you hook that up to a house, that's not a good situation. So that's one thing you want to look out for. You, you can look in the literature or ask the company that you're buying it from to satisfy you that, it, that the neutral and ground are not bonded. If you are unable to find that in the literature, one quick way of doing that, if you have a voltmeter, and, and once again, bear with me. I know this is a little technical here, but <laughs> you guys out there that are a little familiar with electricity, you may have a, and, and I, I say you guys, there's some of you girls out there that are good. Mm -hmm. Lisa's really good with stuff like this too. Sometimes. So she would, <laughs> she'd be all in on this too. But you take your voltmeter, put it into continuity mode, which is where it senses if two wires are connected together. If you touch the two probes together, it beeps. And when it's in continuity mode, stick one of those probes, of course, generators off. Don't do this when the generator's <laughs> running. Stick one probe into the neutral or negative uh, part of the receptacle and one into the ground. If it beeps, then those two are bonded or connected together. If it doesn't beep, then they're not. So that's kind of a quick and easy way. And check that in the receptacle that you would be plugging into. So thank you for giving me my two minutes of... <laughs> technical um, stuff there. Just wanted you to be mm -hmm. aware of that. And let's see, anything else you can think of? Yeah. So transfer switch. Because mm, you don't want to yes. electrocute the lineman if you uh, hook up a generator to your house and you turn it on. When there's a blackout, you could be sending power back down the line and electrocuting a poor lineman right. just trying to get the power back on. Right. Years ago, folks would take the <clears throat> generator and just um, rig up a wire where they could plug it into a receptacle in their house or something like that. And that's a big no-no. Yeah. It's illegal and unsafe. So don't try that. Use a transfer switch. Makes it impossible for you to be hooked up to both the power company and your generator at the same time. Makes it where it's one or the other, but never both. So that's really important. You'll need to get an electrician to wire that into your home and, uh, that's actually a, a whole other topic. We don't have time to talk about that on this particular episode. If you'd like to see an episode about transfer switches, because there's a lot of options there, then let us know. Leave a comment. If yeah. you're on YouTube, leave a comment below this video. If you're not, um, feel free to head over to YouTube and leave a comment there, or you can leave a comment on the show notes page at thereadylife.com forward slash 21. Or you can send us an email at questions at thereadylife.com and let us know about if you'd like to see an episode on that or something else. We always love to hear ideas of, of what you'd like to hear about. One last thing I was thinking of, you mentioned that the gas and the diesel 
generators. Obviously, the fuel doesn't store for very long, but we actually did an episode um, here on the Ready Life podcast where we talked about fuel storage and ways that you can store um, diesel and gasoline for a much longer period of time without it going bad, including the gas that's in your generator. Yeah, good point. What episode was that? So uh, I think that was 18. the- That's right, 18. So yeah. just go to thereadylife.com forward slash 18, and you can watch that episode there. That's right, that's right. And don't forget about maintenance with your generator. This is key, I mean, it's key whether or not you use your generator a lot. I was gonna say it's key if your generator is gonna be sitting there because it's so easy to forget about it, but it's key if you use your generator a lot. So yeah. all the way around, make sure that you keep up with the maintenance, oil changes, air filters, all that kind of stuff. Fuel, what you were just talking about, fuel storage. Mm -hmm. If your generator is carbureted, if it has a carburetor, turn the fuel off and burn and keep the engine running until it dies from starvation, fuel starvation, uh, so that it burns the fuel out of the carb. Do that if your generator isn't going to be running for a little while, for a week or more. And, you know, if if the generator, if the engine is, is liquid cooled, change the coolant periodically, whatever the maintenance schedule is for the generator, keep up with it because that generator is going to be your lifeline if you're, if you are on the grid and this is your backup for off grid, you know, for blackouts and things like that, that generator and the fuel that powers it is going to be your, your lifeline for keeping your home running. And of course, if you are just using your generator as a backup, you don't need to obviously change the oil as often, but you should go out and exercise your generator every once in a while just mm -hmm. to make sure it's working. So that way, when the blackout happens, you're not running out there and finding out, oh, wait, my generator is not working for some reason. Right. You already know that it's working because you regularly, you know, check it and turn it on and exercise it for a little bit. Right. So right. anyway. Cool. So um, just kind of in summary, <laughs> I, I think I mentioned earlier that that I would touch on why we went the route that we did. I'm not recommending it for everybody, but we have a Honda EU series generator, uh, which is the inverter type generator. We have the EU 7000. And it's, uh, I chose that because, um, well, first of all, I liked the inverter generator where it would not, where it's able to idle down when you're not using as much power. Mm -hmm. So, and when you're using your generator to top off your batteries in an off-grid system, there's periods of time where you're not using very much power. You're, if you're trying to get your batteries fully charged periodically, then there are those times, at, especially at the end of the charge cycle, where you're not putting a whole lot of power into them. And that used to always bug me that our generator was running full blast yeah. when we weren't Wasting using a lot much of power. power. Yeah, and so yes, we multitask and all of that, but sometimes we we run out of things to multitask and the generator still needs to run a little bit longer to top those batteries off. And so that's one of the things that I really liked about this is the, how it can idle down and not use as much fuel, not put as much wear and tear on the engine when you're not using as much power. It can idle down pretty significantly and, you know, like I said, I like Honda. We don't run the generator a whole lot, so I didn't feel like we needed to go with some industrial grade propane generator or a diesel generator. And, um, you know, I, I like the flexibility of being able to move it around, but I would have no problem yeah. going with a propane model. So I'm not trying to convince anybody to go with gasoline over propane, but that's a little bit about why we did what we did. And I hope that was helpful. So yeah, let us know uh, if you in the comments here or shoot us an email or whatever. Let us know what you'd like to hear more of. And uh, if you enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, rating on the podcast. And subscribe. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh, and don't forget that calculator. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you go to the show notes page, there will be a link to the calculator there. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.